Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Jane Burke, and I'm a board member of Naperville Preservation, Inc. Um, as you may know, Naperville Preservation, Inc. is a grassroots organization for historic preservation in Naperville. Um, and uh, we're just ordinary folks who live in Naperville, just like you are. We know we have some visitors tonight from other places, so we're grateful for that too. You know, what we're trying to do as an organization is increase the awareness of historic preservation here in Naperville. And we think about that not just in terms of our historic district, but also in terms of preservation of the wide variety of architecture and periods that are represented here in Naperville, which, you know, has been around since the 1830s, 1840s, and of course has grown, you know, to be a fairly large city. But we want to increase our sense of historic preservation, whether it's the historic district or mid-century modern, like in the East Highlands or, you know, other styles represented here in Naperville. And tonight we're just thrilled to have Lisa DiChiara with us. Lisa is the Director of Advocacy for Landmarks Illinois. And Landmarks Illinois is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Um, and they have, you know, over the course of time, over the course of that 50 years, saved more than 24,000 historic places across our state. And we're very grateful that she has come tonight to sort of tell us some stories, give us some hints, let us be more aware of what's going on in the rest of Illinois, um, and just kind of contribute, we hope, to what we're trying to accomplish. So Lisa, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Jane. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me here with all of you this evening. And Jane is correct, Landmarks Illinois is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, as you'll see on our logo that we uh, have revamped for the occasion. Um, if you're wondering why these blue uh, arches are behind me, it's because uh, it is our original 1971 vintage logo. And uh, the year we were founded in 1971, it was a, a great uh, graphic that we, that we adopted at the time to represent the Chicago Stock Exchange, which was the building that uh, brought about our founding. And uh, you'll see that on uh, the left of the screen as well in the uh, brown, the, the arch in the upper right corner. And uh, we lost that building. That was the first loss, but uh, it birthed the organization. And uh, so as Jane said, we've um, been fortunate now after that loss to, to actually have helped preserve over 24,000 buildings in the state as we calculated to date. So with that, uh, I was asked by Naperville Preservation Inc. to give um, an overview of advocacy and uh, the work that we do in the state, although I will say most of my presentation is um, focused on uh, Chicago and Chicago land area, even though we are a statewide historic preservation office, we do have a small office in Springfield as well. And um, I think though that everything I'll show you is universal and uh, we'll have fun looking at um, things from the past and how we see the preservation moving forward in the future. So again, thank you for having me. So again, just to touch on our history, uh, what you'll see here is some great pictures that I enjoy sharing of some really early campaigning days um, from, again, when Landmarks Illinois was a group of, a loose-knit group of people trying to save the Chicago Stock Exchange building, which was unsuccessful. For those of you who are familiar with the arch, it is now on the grounds of the Art Institute of Chicago, and that's what you see down in the lower right-hand corner. And uh, to your right, logos from our history, um, as well as one of the earliest campaign buttons uh, that people wore during that time to try to fight to save the building. But after our uh, official incorporation, we did have some wonderful successes. These are buildings that most of you are familiar with. 
and uh, most importantly, buildings like the Marquette, and, uh, one of the most important examples of the early, early Chicago school, and then also what is now the Chicago Cultural Center, which originally was the downtown Chicago library. And as you can see on the left, there actually was a plan at one time to tear down the Chicago library, public library, and replace it with a tower, as you see on the left. And so Landmark Illinois was critical at that time in saving both of these buildings. And our name at that time was Landmarks Preservation Council. Uh, we would adopt the Illinois part of our name 10 years later when we expanded our mission to be a statewide mission beyond the city of Chicago. One of our most important campaigns that many of you may be familiar with is Ms. Vanderoa's Farnsworth House. And this is a building that uh, we partnered on with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we raised uh, over $2 million to purchase the house at auction and then converted it into a house museum. And if you have not visited the Farnsworth House before in Plano, I encourage you to do so. It is open to the public currently. And uh, it is really one of the great modern masterpieces and really is considered um, one of the most important residential designs in the country. One of our main- Lisa, could I just ask you, can you adjust your mic maybe just a little? We're getting kind of a funny feedback. Okay, is this better if I'm close? Yes, it is. That is better, thank you. So as I was saying, the Farnsworth House was one of our great successes in Plano, Illinois. And so you can see in the images here on the left uh, from the time that we successfully purchased the house at auction with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And thanks to the, to the donations of many important donors who were part of that effort, including John Bryan. And then on the right was one of our uh, unfortunate losses, and that was the old Prentice Women's Hospital in the Streeterville neighborhood of Chicago, designed by Bertrand Goldberg. And for those of you who are not familiar with the architect Bertrand Goldberg, I'm sure you are familiar with his uh, very famous building, Marina City, in Chicago on the Chicago River, same architect. And so this is a, a building that we campaigned to save for several years and unfortunately uh, were not successful. Again, pictures from the ribbon cutting for the Farnsworth House. And the other reason I put this image here is because uh, many people are familiar with our organization from our annual Most Endangered Historic Places list. So indeed, Farnsworth House was on our list, uh, which really helped launch our advocacy campaign for that building. Here's another example of a past building that has been on our endangered list, uh, the former Dempster Station in Skokie, which was on our list in 1995. And uh, the great public attention that was brought to the building uh, enabled the building to finally be reevaluated uh, by the city of Skokie and by um, the various governmental entities that were involved at the time. And it was uh, converted to private use and today is a Starbucks and uh, later received a preservation award from our organization as well. I'd say probably uh, our most recent and most successful campaign that has come to a great uh, outcome is the Old Cook County Hospital. If many of you uh, dr have driven into the city of Chicago on the 290 Expressway, you have passed that building many times in your lives. Um, also very famous for the television show that was uh, took place there. And we started campaigning for this building 21 years ago. So the building finally, um, and by the way, that is uh, me down in the lower right image, uh, going through one of the corridors at, at the time that it was still abandoned and, and not sure we were gonna be successful. Um, here in this image, you'll see that this is now the building today in the lower image. Uh, we had a 
groundbreaking only about three years ago. That's the image you see on the top. And uh, Murphy Development and Walsh Construction came to the rescue of this building. It's a long, long story of how we got there, 21 years, as I said. But right now, I would say Old Cook County Hospital is probably um, next to the Farnsworth House, one of our greatest accomplishments as an organization, and one that we're, of which we're very proud. So with that, just a little um, pitch for everyone. We announce our next annual Most Endangered Historic Places list next Wednesday, May 5th and hope you will register. It's a Zoom webinar virtual announcement, although it will be on Facebook Live as well on the Landmarks Illinois Facebook page. And we look forward to your attending our announcement at noon that day. And you will see places that are on the list that may be familiar, uh, as well as places I'm sure you've never heard of as well. And that is the point of our organization, is to bring to light the important places that exist throughout our entire state in communities, large and small. And uh, many of the places that we are highlighting are not necessarily important for their architecture, but also very important for their cultural heritage. And that's another area that I'm sure Naperville Preservation Inc. will continue to focus as well, that uh, historic preservation is not just about important design and important architecture. It is also about places that really uh, tell the story of our communities from a history perspective. So before Landmarks Illinois, there were other historic preservation advocacy efforts in the state. Um, the example I wanted to bring forth here was, is Woodstock. Um, Woodstock is a beautiful community that I'm sure many have visited. And what I really love about this early clipping from 1974 is it really shows how um, the 70s and, and the 60s even were really the time that historic preservation advocacy was becoming much more common in communities across the nation. And uh, I love this quote uh, about, uh, you know, the feeling that communities now were feeling that it was necessary to build parking lots. Um, somehow communities functioned without parking lots before. <laughs> and of course, now it was so important to tear down buildings to create parking lots. And um, of course, uh, the Woodstock uh, Courthouse and the Woodstock Opera House in Woodstock were two of the most um, really important buildings. But if you can imagine one of those buildings coming down to make way for a parking lot, uh, it, it, today that town wouldn't even have half the number of visitors that they do. Uh, it, it, it is, those buildings make their town square and is what is the destination for their heritage tourism in Woodstock. And here you can see um, that even in the early 70s, the Opera House was really a, a key building to bring people into the community. Today, the uh, Opera House continues to be a real anchor of their downtown commercial district and um, basically demonstrates not only how important it is to preserve and maintain really important historic buildings in one's community, but also talks about the arts and how the arts can also be a real uh, destination and means for uh, economic development in the communities downtown. So why does a municipality adopt a historic preservation ordinance? Um, one thing that I do in my work at Landmarks Illinois as Director of Advocacy is I work not only with people who are um, involved in trying to save places in their communities, but I also work with public officials and elected officials, uh, planning staff. And one thing that's um, a constant, uh, I don't want to say struggle, but something we have to remind um, a lot of our elected officials and planning officials is that historic preservation and by virtue of historic preservation ordinance is a land use tool. 
uh, like a zoning ordinance, when a community adopts a historic preservation ordinance, it is just another tool in the toolbox when it comes to what future land use will be in a community. But one thing I want to make uh, important, an important point here, as stated by Don Ripkema, who is a very well-known economist who specializes in studying historic preservation and how historic preservation is good for the economy. As you can see here in red, he says, historic preservation is not about cities being the museums of yesterday. Historic preservation is about using heritage resources to build quality of life for tomorrow. And with that, a program that has existed for a very long time in partnership between the National Park Service and local state historic preservation offices and local governments is the Certified Local Government Program, known short as CLG. And the Certified Local Government Program is one where the State Historic Preservation Office basically evaluates the Historic Preservation Ordinance of the community. And if they feel that that ordinance meets certain standards, um, that ordinance can be certified and thereby that community is given a CLG, is given CLG status. And in the state of Illinois, we now have 82 certified local governments. Um, Naperville was certified in 1996. So that meant that in 1996, the ordinance as, as developed by the city of Naperville um, was approved by the State Historic Preservation Office of Illinois, uh, which is based in Springfield. Many of you may, from your years of working in historic preservation, think of that office as IHPA, Illinois Historic Preservation Agency, but it's actually not called IHPA anymore. It is now officially the Illinois State Historic Preservation Office. And being a CLG, as you can see in the quote from the National Park Service's website, demonstrates your community's commitment to saving what is important from the past for future generations. So one way communities make that decision as to what they want to save and what they want to prioritize is through survey. And so survey, again, is so critical for communities and whether it is a um, actual study that is commissioned by the municipality where you bring in professional historic preservation consultants or historians to do the identifying and documenting of places throughout a community that uh, represent different architectural styles, different periods of growth, um, or it can be a community-driven survey as well. We have a lot of communities where um, it can be a volunteer effort or it can be led by a, a, a community group like a Naperville Preservation Inc. Um, it's just important to get it all documented, to basically understand what is out there, what's the inventory, what do we have, what do we not have. The only flaw now in surveys is that usually when surveys are done, it is about the architecture, it's about the aesthetics. And what we're learning more and more, especially in places here, like in Chicago, is that there are many places that are important that should be included in surveys that are important not for their architecture per se, but for their history. And that's a whole other layer of research that often is important to do as well. So here in Highland Park, um, here is a building that obviously not only was included in their survey, but was locally landmarked. And the landmark ordinance in, um, in Highland Park um, now does require owner consent. Um, at the time that the Rose House was landmarked, the owners did consent even before the ordinance was changed because those owners recognized the importance of this, of this very um, special modern home. And many of you are familiar with this home from, um, excuse me, from 
uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And uh, it's a very famous home, but at one time it was threatened and uh, the, the owners had passed away and um, a descendant was hoping to uh, obtain a demolition permit to be able to sell the site as a cleared site. And luckily, um, Highland Park held strong and maintained this landmark designation as a protection. However, there are plenty of other uh, places that we're continuing to lose in communities like Highland Park. Um, this was a really special mid-century poem designed by Edward Dart that was demolished in 2015 with no landmark protection. And um, this is going to be an ongoing struggle as so many of our suburban communities are always dealing with, with teardowns. Mid-century homes continue to really be especially threatened. And uh, the Edward Dart home that I showed you, that's a name architect. That's an architect that many people actually recognize who is widely published. These are the homes that we're even losing more. Um, and these mid-century homes are often architect designed as well, um, or by developers that were very uh, prolific in specific communities. Um, and the irony is, as you can see from the sign on the left, that the developer who was going to build a home to replace this mid-century home was sort of historicizing, <laughs> designing a home that was going to be um, sort of mimicking the past. So, um, you know, it's going to be important for communities to continue through survey work to decide where we want to prioritize protection. Here's an example of some communities that have done a good job of protecting some of their mid-century architecture. Um, in Park Ridge, this home in, uh, by Bruce Goff was uh, designated only a couple years ago. And then in Blue Island, uh, a Bertrand Goldberg design home um, and with the owners in the, in the lower right corner uh, with some of us uh, from various preservation organizations a few years ago. Um, are proud owners of this home and uh, proactively had it landmarked. So one thing I want to talk about here is, um, again, with local historic districts and landmarking, why this is important, why this is an important tool to have in the toolbox. And I'm not going to get into the debate here today of owner consent versus non-owner consent, because that could be a presentation on its own. Um, and many communities have different perspectives on it from the perspective of um, is this a taking, is it not a taking? Um, obviously, we believe it's not a taking because like zoning, it, it, it again is it's land use. It's, it's what is the priority of a community in terms of what they want to see uh, in terms of character, in terms of uh, the type of housing that's going to be available for generations to come. So from our perspective, landmarking is important not only because it provides protection and encourages investment in older buildings, but it also, we know statistically, increases and stabilizes the market value of older properties and older neighborhoods. This is an example of a property in Plainfield that is a local landmark. And property values um, is a question we get all the time, which is if my home is included in a landmark district, if my home is designated as an individual landmark, um, will it lower my property value? And uh, in 2008, the city of Rockford did a really interesting study that basically showed in, in 2008, we're coming you know, right in that housing market crash period. Um, their study showed through assessed valuations that owner occupancy and sales prices were higher in all of the city's historic districts. And that basically that's where value held was in the historic districts during that very volatile um, housing market period. And indeed, Don Ripkema, who I mentioned earlier, has done studies nationwide that holds that, that during these ebbs and flows of the housing market, historic districts always stay very stable. So that brings us to financial incentives and financial incentives are very important 
to offer to owners of older and historic homes and commercial buildings. And so I'm just going to give a brief overview of those incentives, both at the federal and the state level. And uh, what we'll review just quickly, as you'll see from the bullet point list here, is the property tax assessment freeze, which is the residential incentive, incentive available in the state, which is a program that our organization lobbied for years ago. The federal historic tax credit program, which has been around since the 1980s and is extremely successful for income producing commercial properties or income residential properties. And then in the state, we also have, based on our years of lobbying, mostly with our partners, AIA Illinois, um, a historic tax credit that is available for five specific cities that are called the River Edge cities, and then an overall state historic tax credit program. So the property tax freeze program, I think is one that most people on this um, Zoom presentation today are going to be interested in because so many um, of you work with homeowners and uh, looking to find ways for homes to be properly invested in and maintained. And the property tax assessment freeze has really proven to be a great tool. And you'll see here um, in Highland Park, an example of a Frank Lloyd Wright designed house that um, what it looks like before and after a rehabilitation using the freeze. So the property tax assessment freeze um, basically is an opportunity to, in the end, award a, a homeowner for making that investment in a landmark property. And so what happens is by making that investment and what the investment has to be is what we call a qualified renovation. It is work that has to be done in accordance with the Secretary of Interior standards that is mostly adopted by communities that have historic preservation ordinances. But in this case, the State Historic Preservation Office reviewing architects, that is their set of standards that they use. And so they will review interiors as well as exterior. They're not gonna care about bathrooms and kitchens and closets. <laughs> They're more concerned about the public space, the living room, the dining room, those places that really give you the feel of the history of the home, and then the exterior. And so 25% of the property's um, assessed valuation uh, is spent by the homeowner on that qualified rehabilitation. And then in return for eight years, the, um, the assessed value of the property taxes is frozen. And then for four years after that, it goes up in quarterly increments to where it would be at that point in time. So again, the owner must spend 25% of the assessor's market value. Um, and then the renovation has to be in accordance with the Secretary of Interior Standards. And here's the after picture of the same home you saw in Plainfield on the previous page, which is an individually designated landmark. The um, interior spaces are reviewed, as I said, and you can see here that this is the main living room parlor. And um, one thing that's interesting about the freeze is we have had some communities that sometimes have said, oh, I really don't think we should have the property tax assessment fees available in our community. We had this problem in Highland Park where the school districts were opting out and we still have this problem in Riverside. Um, we've tried to make the point, this is not such an easy program that dozens of people are going to go out and use this and now all of a sudden the community is going to lose, uh, you know, the, the ability to bring in funds from, to fund schools and parks. It's just the number of properties that use this, um, this incentive is very small. Um, it's not easy. You have to go through a, a design review process with the architects of the, of the State Historic Preservation Office. And interestingly, for those homes that do use the incentive, um, sometimes a homeowner doesn't stay in that home for 12 years after the renovation to be able to continue to use the um, incentive. The house may be sold and the freeze, this incentive does not transfer to the next owner. It only stays with the owner that did the work and who occupies the home. 
Now, a developer can buy a historically designated property, rehab it, use the freeze, and market the home for sale with the freeze for a first time buyer. And so that is something, a way that um, we can try to continue to encourage um, builders and rehabbers to use the freeze as well and to rehab older designated homes. In Naperville, I've created a list of houses that have used the freeze in the past. I received this information from the State Historic Preservation Office because it is public information. So some of you may be familiar with some of these addresses and the home on the left. And so um, again, Naperville is a big place and um, has a lot of homes in its historic district. But right now, this is the only um, these are the only addresses we're familiar with of uh, properties where owners in the past have used the property tax assessment freeze. The Federal Historic Tax Credit. As I said, this is an incentive that's been around since the 1980s. Uh, the way it works is uh, similar to the freeze in that a qualified rehabilitation has to be done of the property. The difference here is that the property has to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places, either contrib contributing to a district or individually listed. Um, basically, that's because this is a federal incentive. And uh, so therefore, uh, the designation has to be at the federal level, the National Register. Whereas with the property tax assessment freeze that I discussed before, homes could qualify for that incentive, whether they're locally designated or whether they're in the National Register. Here, the way this program works is that within a um, rehabilitation of a project, a 20% tax credit is available to the developer, a dollar for dollar credit uh, to basically um, help with the financing of, of the overall rehabilitation. And what's interesting is that we think of the buildings that we would assume would use this type of incentive. Downtown commercial buildings that are being converted to hotels, um, you know, the biggies, the, the, the buildings that are famous, like our old Cook County Hospital that I talked about earlier, used the 20% uh, historic tax credit. But there's been other creative ways that this credit has been used. For example, here is um, a former mansion in Lake Bluff that was purchased by the Terlato Wine Group and converted to offices. And so because that's considered an income producing use as their corporate headquarters, they were able to use 20% historic tax credit for the rehabilitation and use of this, of this estate house. In Plainfield, here is a really beautiful transformation using the 20% tax credit. And, uh, you know, pictures are a thousand words. You can see right here um, how vital this incentive was to really get this building back to its original integrity. Here's an interesting reuse using the 20% tax credit in Peoria. Uh, in Peoria, um, the Khan Group, which is a, a wonderful uh, corporation that we gave an award to some years ago for their work in historic preservation in Peoria and Springfield, converted a historic church to a microbrewery. And again, using the 20% uh, tax credit that I was, uh, have been speaking to, but in this case, they also layered it um, with the state historic tax credit, which is a 25% tax credit. And uh, the one that I referred to that is for some river edge cities and Peoria falls into that category. So the cons were able to take a 20% federal historic tax credit and then the 25% historic tax credit from the state, layer those two um, for dollar for dollar credits out of their overall budget. In Naperville, um, I have record of three properties using the federal historic tax credits in the past. One is one that I'm sure Naperville residents are very familiar with, the former post office which was um, purchased and rehabbed and converted for bank use by Neighborville Bank and Trust. Um, also, the former Crayler Furniture Factory, 
on Fifth Street was rehabbed and used uh, using federal historic tax credits all the way back in 1990. Another place that's not far from Naperville that we gave an award to just last year is the Aurora Arts Center, uh, which used federal historic tax credits. And in this case, this is really interesting because this is a project that is really multifaceted. It's a building that not only is used for retail and arts uh, uses, but also there, is, there are affordable housing units in this building as well. And so the developer in that case was layering not only historic tax credits, but affordable housing tax credits for the project as well. Excuse me while I take a sip of water. So one thing I wanted to do was just to give you all a quick little legislative um, update. So here our 20% federal historic tax credit is so successful and so important for all of the uh, rehabilitations that take place in Illinois nationwide. There is currently a bill uh, that has been introduced in Congress that is uh, co-sponsored actually by uh, Republican Representative Darren LaHood in Central Illinois. And uh, we're looking to all of you, everyone on this uh, Zoom webinar to reach out to their congressperson to support this bill, HR 2294. But for those of you in the Naperville area, I encourage you to reach out to Representative Foster because what the bill is aiming to do is to make some interesting uh, tweaks to the program, uh, both for short term as well as permanent. And for short term, it's to basically convert the 20% um, tax credit to a 30% tax credit, uh, basically for a time period through 2024 and then phasing it back to 20 by 2027. And this is basically pandemic recovery. This is the opportunity to, again, stimulate um, real estate development through historic rehab. Um, you can see here from the bullet points, other things that are being proposed in this legislation, including keeping 30% permanent for smaller projects under $2.5 million to make it easier for those projects to get completed. Um, also, making it easier for nonprofit organizations to be involved in, in the partnerships of these types of projects. So I don't want to dwell on this much, but I just want you to see that there is legislation out there. And I recommend if people want to learn more about this to go to the website of Preservation Action, which is preservationaction.org. Um, I was asked to just briefly speak about easements. Easements are um, another interesting protective tool for preserving historic properties in Naperville. Landmarks Illinois holds two preservation easements on these houses that you see. And what an easement is, is it's basically a legal agreement between a property owner and a qualified easement holding organization such as ours, but there are other organizations that hold easements as well, like the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy. And um, basically it's where an owner recognizes that their property, which needs to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places, either contributing to a district or individually, um, want to protect that property. A lot of people don't remember or realize that when a property is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, it is not protected. The National Register is purely honorific. The only way that anyone's property is protected if it's listed in the National Register is if the local government chooses to also overlay local protection through your local preservation ordinance. So for instance, in Naperville, your National Register district does have some local overlay of a local district. Um, I don't know if that's the case for all of the homes, but in this case, these two homes also, these owners chose to, can, to donate easements to Landmarks Illinois to give further protection for these properties. There is the opportunity 
for a homeowner or a commercial building owner as well when they donate an easement to um, receive some type of uh, federal tax deduction. We as an organization are not involved in uh, that process because it's based on an appraisal process. But basically we're the nonprofit organization that holds the easement that enables that property owner to donate uh, the easement and then in turn um, can receive some type of uh, federal tax deduction. This uh, tool, the easement, is extremely strong and basically our organization holds protection on these properties in perpetuity. We also annually inspect these properties. We hold close to 600 easements now in the state of Illinois. Um, and so every year we are obligated to inspect all of these properties to make sure that they are being well maintained. We also become partners with these owners in terms of they come to us, they talk to us about changes that they want to make to the property. We review those changes and then basically we can sometimes become a sounding board as well in terms of best practices and ways to um, rehabilitate properties. And um, the, the overall purpose of the easement is to not allow these buildings to be demolished. So with that, I wanted to just touch on one of your neighboring organizations, um, one that I really think has done such a wonderful job and that's Downers Grove. And um, everything that I just talked about are great preservation successes, thanks to wonderful incentives that we need to continue to advocate for. Um, interestingly, Downers Grove had a situation just a few years ago where um, this very historic home, the Edwards House, was purchased by a developer to be demolished. And um, there was no way for Downers Grove to basically prevent the demolition based on the way their ordinance was written and um, based on the process by which the developer acquired the property. It was a real wake up call for the community. Essentially, the demolition of the Edwards House became a sacrificial lamb. It gave the incentive for the community to organize. And uh, what was really interesting was rather than just taking defeat um, for a home that everyone just universally recognized as being extremely important to the community, um, there was some real sort of, um, uh, you know, come together, what can we do? How can we prevent this from happening in the future? And what the result was, was basically a redo of their ordinance and some real door-to-door -door campaigning. Um, here in this image on the left, uh, Rich Kulavani and Amy Gasson, who were two of the primary uh, local advocates, basically started working with a coalition of residents. And while one Part of the effort was to work with the mayor, the village board, and the city staff to clean up their ordinance, to strengthen their ordinance, but at the same time streamline their ordinance. Because what they came to realize is that their ordinance was very confusing, it was prohibitive, it charged way too much money for someone to take the initiative to want to landmark and protect their home. So that was one basically uh, important role that the community took on. But the other important role was to just start talking to people and to literally start going door to door and understanding from people um, what they knew about their home and what history did they already have about their home. And if they didn't know that history, how can we help you research that house? And um, also coming to basically uh, encourage people to proactively landmark their homes. Uh, and so, as you can see here on the left, um, this really became a campaign. And uh, interestingly, since this effort uh, started, um, Downers Grove saw individual landmark designations increase beyond what it had ever been before. I think they are now somewhere in the range of 20-something um, landmarks that have been locally designated um, since this campaign began. 
and Rich Kilivane, who you see on the left, actually went ahead and ran for village board. <laughs> so we have a preservationist serving on the village board of Downers Grove as well. And this is an example, again, of just some of the other activities that they took on um, to, to educate people about landmarking and what landmarking means. And another program that they took on uh, that Amy and her husband really initiated was embracing what is one of the most character defining aspects of our community in terms of our architecture. And they realized it was the four square. It was just the down home, simple, small town, um, but beautiful uh, home design that is so prevalent in Downers Grove, but was being lost through teardowns. And so what they did, again, the importance of survey, and you can see here at the bottom of the screen, the work that they did as volunteers to basically go out and identify all the four squares in Downers Grove, and then to create a coalition of homeowners who could then become um, acquainted with each other and exchange information on rehab and best techniques and um, also about the property tax assessment freeze and the benefits of um, rehabbing and protecting. So here is a, um, also a picture of Mayor Tully and some um, members of the Edwards House uh, organization that has gone on to do this work. And then we too gave uh, the group award uh, in 2017 our Richard Greenhouse Preservation Award, which that year we gave them for advocacy for their really incredible work um, after the loss of the Edwards House. So that brings us to Naperville. And um, obviously Naperville Inc. Um, has been really lucky because um, we didn't quite have the sacrificial lamb <laughs> that Downers Grove did. Thank goodness the Nichols Library um, has been preserved. And that's how I first came to know all of you. And uh, it's been such a great success. And um, I want to really give you kudos for the organization that formed as a result of that campaign to save this building. Just real quickly, I just want to just real fast give you just a couple ideas of some things that we're involved in that don't involve protest. <laughs> As an advocacy organization, we do protest. This is part of our history. We have a lot of times where we have been um, on the picket line. It's not every day. It's not something we like to do. It's something that once in a while we realize we still have to do. But again, the types of projects that we're more interested in are the proactive types of projects that allow us to work with communities and try to, um, ahead of time, identify those things that are important to a community and really talk about the opportunity to um, protect places that matter. So we have been involved in a, in a um, Cook County suburban survey now for over 10 years in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's Historic Preservation Program for recent past architecture. It's non-residential. Um, what the focus has been, have been those buildings that are um, part of our community from the standpoint of churches and schools and governmental buildings and commercial buildings. And so now um, we have a really incredible database available on our website that anyone can see that comes uh, that continues to grow and get added onto every year based on the class of students each year and the communities that they go to survey. This has been a counterclockwise effort for us. It started on the North Shore and now we're all the way down in the South Suburbs. And um, I really encourage people to go and look at this survey because um, it's really uncovered some spectacular mid-century architecture. And again, these are the buildings a lot of people don't understand. <laughs> and so we have a lot of educating to do. And um, what's fascinating about this survey to me is that it's not only picked up buildings by well-known architects, Skid Rowings and Merrill, Perkins and Will, um, but architects that were local, architects that worked in their, worked and were housed in those communities. And it's a way to really honor 
um, the history of, of developers and architects that are um, local and have helped our communities become what they are today. The other thing that we do a lot is we do reuse studies. And um, you may have caught a picture when I showed Old Cook County Hospital that we did actually several reuse studies for Old Cook County Hospital to, again, really help us demonstrate to county officials that that building was not a throwaway building and had the ability to be repurposed. Um, this is one we did just a couple of years ago in Elgin. And um, this is, a, again, another Bertrand Goldberg design building, very um, unusual building built as a laundry building as part of a psychiatric um, campus that was owned by the state. This is what the building looks like today in the upper left corner. And um, we highlighted the building, um, not on our uh, endangered list, but on a list we used to have that we called our Chicagoland watch list. We basically approached the city of Elgin and we said, let us show you, let us demonstrate to you the way that we feel this building can be used in the future. Because we don't want it to just, we don't want to be in a situation where it's too late, where we hear the city is going to demolish it, and then we've had no opportunity to engage. So what we did is we brought together a group of architects to evaluate this building from Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. They looked at the history of the building, both in terms of the way it operated and its original design. And then they put together a really spectacular um, reuse study for us that made sense because it's the park district of Elgin that now has possession of this building that is just at this point really using as storage. We wanted to be able to demonstrate that this building could be actually repurposed for, um, for sports types of uses. So here you can see that several scenarios were put forth by Skidmore and Merrill. That really demonstrated whether it was basketball, whether it was indoor soccer, that this is a building that really has the ability to have a, oh, I'm sorry, have a great new use and um, the city of Elgin is not in a place economically right now where they can take this on, but this is something that we at Landmarks Illinois view to be extremely important and um, and I welcome um, you know communities to come to us and talk to us about buildings where they just feel like they need that technical assistance to envision what it could be in the future. Um, another project that we're really involved, I'm very excited to present to you and that, we, that we're really happy to, to have launched and I have just loved being involved in is what we're calling our Women Who Built Illinois survey. Um, so we included a, a building on our endangered list just a couple of years ago by Gertrude Purvis, um, the Rotunda building at O'Hare Airport that was uh, designed by her in 1962 when um, she was with CF Murphy and Associates. This is because of the ongoing expansion of terminals and, and changes at O'Hare that we felt this building was very vulnerable. But what happened is after we put this building on our list, we came to realize there are so many women who are important uh, in the history of the state's architectural legacy who have just never been properly recognized. And so we have now um, accumulated a database of close to 100 women um, that we believe um, deserve recognition and have just never been uh, properly recognized, either because they worked for other famous architects, like in this case, Georgia Louise Harris Brown, who worked for Miss Vanderoa, um, and Captain Keck, and whose name is just never going to rise to the surface for those buildings that those firms are best known for. But um, because, I, you know, these spaces you're familiar with, you are familiar with these men <laughs> at the bottom of the page. And in the city of Chicago, um, you know, we have thousands of landmark buildings in the city now, both in districts and individually, not one building designed by a woman is protected as an officially landmarked building in the city of Chicago. And so that is the other purpose of our work with the Women Who Built Illinois survey, is that we want to continue to identify and catalog 
um, the buildings that these women not only designed, but in a lot of cases developed as builders, as developers. Um, we're also looking for women engineers, landscape architects, and um, we also have a few interior designers in there as well. And this is something where we're crowdsourcing. We want you to bring to us any women that you're familiar with who had an impact on your community and the built environment of your community and to um, bring those people forward to us and we can include, um, include them in our database. And then we're gonna look to the local communities to then evaluate those buildings and, um, and take them through the process of either are they uh, eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places for any potential historic district, depending on how much they did in the community, um, or in terms of communities with local ordinances to get them locally protected. And here's just a sampling of the of some of the buildings that we've unearthed um, through this project that are both designed and built by uh, by women here in Illinois. With that, I am just going to round up here. Again, just some common sense uh, thoughts about historic preservation, that it's good for business. And um, this is, you know, these are realtors talking. <laughs> you know, the historic properties um, are important because they basically define the character of the community. Um, based on past surveys, people want communities that are walkable, um, that look like established neighborhoods and um, where we can feel like it, 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 that, that it's home. Also, the other thing to always remember is that historic preservation creates jobs. And um, I always try to remind people when you're trying to make that convincing argument about why it's also more important to rehab than to demolish and build new, is rehab is more labor intensive. It creates more jobs than new construction. In new construction, majority of budget goes to materials. In rehab, majority of budget goes to labor. So inevitably, rehab creates more jobs and often local jobs. Lastly, we all have talked about this, that the greenest building is the one that's already built. So for all of those communities that want to talk about sustainability, that want to pride themselves in being sustainable, historic preservation should be part of that initiative. Any community that thinks it's important to recycle, recycle your buildings. More building waste goes into our landfills almost than anything else. And so again, it's common sense. With that, I leave you my contact information. Um, I hope you will reach out to us, both um, in terms of uh, participating in any of our virtual programs. Please become a member of Landmarks Illinois. Uh, we're $35 a year and uh, your membership supports what we do and helps us help you. So with that, Thank you so much for having me, Jane. Oh, Lisa, thank you. I, I, what a tremendous, tremendous presentation. Thank you, thank you so, so much. I, I can't speak for everybody, but I know that I have learned a great deal and I'm sure everyone else has too. There are a couple of questions. So I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes because we're pushing at the hour here, but um, I guess a testament to the, your presentation is there's a question, uh, will the presentation be available? So could it be available on the Landmarks Illinois site or could we possibly get it for um, our site? So from what I understood from um, Naperville Preservation Inc is that I think this was recorded and that it was going to be posted on the Naperville Great. Preservation Inc website. Great, okay. So um, there was a, just a comment from Arthur Dietrichson who said the Farnsworth House was featured on WGN this morning. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I, I so, missed yeah, so maybe that was a lead up to some of the work that you're going to be doing next week. Um, we have a question, and the question is from Julie. She says, an organization I belong to owns an 1899 building that is a Naperville local landmark. 
Does landmark status give us any protection from encroaching developers? And you certainly talked about some aspects of that. Just can you just recap a couple things there for us? Yeah, I think again, always make sure when you are working on a particular building in your community that you've got the facts correct. People all oh, it's so easy to do to get very and it is confusing, but it's very easy to get confused about what designation a building may or may not have. So really clarify, is this building listed in the National Register of Historic Places alone? Is it landmarked at the local level? Is it both? All of those answers are important because not only is that going to help you understand whether the building is truly protected or not, but it's also going to help you understand what incentives are available to promote for its rehabilitation as well. Um, now, if this is a building that's owned by a nonprofit organization, obviously that's different too. Nonprofits don't pay taxes, so tax incentives are not, you know, uh, available for nonprofits. They have to partner with an entity that basically can, um, that has tax liability in order for incentives to work for a rehab project. So it's really important to just really understand what are the set of facts. Now, planning staff will know that in, in, in your department of planning and in, in any of your communities, they're gonna know whether a property is listed in the National Register whether it's in a district, whether it's individually designated, whether it's a local level. And then of course the question is, if it is locally landmarked, how much teeth does your ordinance have? What is that protection? Um, in some communities, it, it too also, it may all, uh, only be honorific. So, uh, you know, Winnetka, if, you, if, if, a, if a home is, is landmarked in, in Winnetka, it is not protected. It is purely honorific. Um, so the ordinance and really understanding how strong the ordinance is and what it says is also really important. There's also other laws that come with properties that are either officially listed in the National Register or even deemed eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Certain laws come in play where the State Historic Preservation Office can come in and intervene on a proposed demolition or alteration to a property, but only under certain circumstances. For instance, if public funds are being used, state or federal funds specifically, um, as part of that proposed demolition of course. Mm -hmm. or alteration. So those are the things that need to be understood. Okay, thank you. So uh, Philip asked, uh, based on what you said about uh, women architects, off the top of your head, are any of them associated with Naperville or DuPage County? So <laughs> DuPage County, yes. Um, we do have um, actually some women that I think, I think I heard earlier that we may have some Lombard folks uh, on this uh, webinar. So um, we do have uh, women who are very active in some of the Western suburbs, um, Naperville, uh, Becky Simon and I did try to hunt down one particular woman who we thought was someone in Naperville and, and Becky now I'm forgetting her name because it was already now like over a year ago we were talking about it and we just couldn't find information about her um, uh, because her name was marketed in association with one house that was being uh -huh. in Naperville and we just weren't able to find any more information about her and so I welcome any anything anyone knows um, to please send it our way. Our hope is to have our database up on our website in June. Um, and at that point in time, everyone can peruse it, look at who we have in there, tell us who we're missing. And in some cases, we may have the person that you're thinking of, but we may not have enough information on that person. We're looking for information on projects and photographs and, and um, other direct sort of oral histories and things like that. So that's why I call it a crowdsourcing database. Right, right. Well, sometimes those are the very best kind. Yeah. Okay, um, one last question before we let you go. 
Um, what we, what do you think are the primary funding sources that are available? If you were going to start looking for funding sources for public and government buildings, where would you start? Well, for public and government buildings, um, again, a lot of times it is up to a local municipality. Um, it, it's really important that when local municipalities are thinking about their comprehensive plans, um, you know, again, what are those buildings that are going to require investment in the future? Whether it's a school, whether it's a city hall, um, whether it's uh, a park and recreation type of building. Um, obviously, bonds and other types of typical financing um, sources that are used by local governments um, for non-historic buildings are still the solution for historic buildings. <laughs> you know, there, it shouldn't be just because it's a historic building that there has to be, a, you know, a whole new think outside the box. It should still be a priority to a local government to invest in and maintain its own real estate, whether it's older or whether it's going to be new construction. Um, there are some uh, funds out there, uh, you know, federal funds, federal grants, things like that. It's case by case basis. It's hard to say go to this source because a lot of times, again, it's gonna, it depends on who is the owner going to be. Is this a situation where it's going to remain in public ownership or like the Thompson Center, which is right now a major campaign for us, State wants to sell the Thompson Center. Um, so here our language from Thompson Center is, this is a public building now. The state wants to take it through an RFP process. We're trying to help developers understand what the incentives could be for rehabbing and using that building. Um, if the state was still going to own and occupy that building, um, you know, they've never maintained that building, <laughs> which is why we're in the situation we're in with Thompson Center. Um, you know, it, 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 it's the same problem where governments are very strapped financially for uh, maintaining any of their real estate, whether it's historic or not historic. So I know that was sort of a runaround answer. What I would welcome is for you to contact me about the building in particular that you're concerned about, and I can troubleshoot it with you. Great. That's, a, that's generous of you, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I think we wanna just thank you so much. Um, I think that you've really helped us with our goal here, which is very much about, you know, increasing awareness of historic preservation in our own community. Uh, you've shown us some great examples uh, across Illinois and across, you know, history. And I just think this has been so terrific and we're just so, so very, very grateful. Well, thank so. you. Jane, and thank all of you for attending tonight. And, uh, you know, I, and if I didn't address something that you were interested in knowing more about, again, please feel free to reach out to me. And please go to our website, landmarks.org, as you see here, um, to listen to our endangered list announcement um, on Wednesday. We also have our nominations open right now for our awards, our Richard H. Greenhouse Preservation Awards. June, uh, I believe June 1st is our deadline for uh, nominations for preservation projects around the state. So welcome you to look at that on our website as well. And also please go to our website, naperville.preservation.org. But thank you all so very much for attending and Lisa, just huge, huge thanks. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.